Hello folks, how's everybody doing out there? Welcome to the latest installment of our alphabetical history of software in three letter acronyms and initialisms and abbreviations just for all the folks out there who skipped episode A where we covered all this. This week it's G and G is for GNU and GNU is the first recursive acronym in our series because the G in GNU stands for GNU and GNU stands for GNU's not Unix. It might seem a little odd to have a project that's explicitly named after what it isn't, but the GNU project's interesting because the rationale behind it isn't technological, it's ideological. In 1980, the folks at Xerox donated a laser printer to the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Xerox and MIT were both a really big deal in the early days of computer science. Xerox came up with dozens of astonishing innovations, but their high-ups were terrified of shipping anything that might threaten their photocopier business. And sure enough, 50 years later, they're still making photocopiers. And MIT? MIT gave the world Lisp, fax machines, passwords, Ethernet, email, the Apollo 11 guidance software, RSA cryptography, spreadsheets, blockchains, the Roomba, and maybe free software. You see, the new laser printer had a problem. Just like a photocopier, it suffered from paper jams. Now, when a photocopier jams, it jams right there while you're stood in front of it making your copies. And so you swear a bit and you open up the side and you remove that shredded bit of paper that's causing the jam. And then you close the door and hopefully it all starts up again. But a network printer, yeah, that's on the other side of the building. So you send your print job and then the next time you go to get a cup of coffee, you swing by the printer to pick it up and you discover the printer's jammed. And it isn't jammed on your job, it's been jammed all morning. So you unjam it and you go back to your desk and when you come back a bit later, you find out it's jammed again. One of the folks working in the MIT lab at the time was this guy, Richard Stallman, also known as RMS. Now folks, you don't need to leave comments telling me what you think about Richard Stallman. Please just accept that the GNU project is a vitally important chapter in the history of our industry, that it's impossible to tell that story without acknowledging Stallman's role in it, and if I tried to provide context by including every detail and story I've heard about Stallman, this would be a five-hour video that contradicted itself at least a dozen times. The way Stallman tells the story, he wanted to modify their new laser printer so that when it jammed, it would notify everybody who was logged into the network so whoever was nearby could go and clear the jam right away. Pretty neat solution, huh? So he asked Xerox for the source code for the printer's operating software, and they said no. They refused to let him have it. According to one interpretation, this incident galvanized Stallman into dedicating the rest of his life to promoting free and open software. Another interpretation is that it made him so angry he's still seething about it four decades later. I suspect both interpretations are true. But Stallman has spoken multiple times about that Xerox printer incident and said that was what inspired his commitment to free software activism over the next few decades. Stallman founded the GNU project in 1983 with the explicit goal of developing a completely free Unix compatible operating system. A system that could do everything Unix did, but was not Unix. Technically compatible, or at least familiar, but legally and ideologically completely distinct. The project's ethos was captured in what they called the four essential freedoms, which of course they numbered from zero, because to the kind of people who invent operating systems, that's extremely funny. Freedom zero, the freedom to run the program however you want for any purpose. Freedom one, the freedom to study how the program works and modify it to do what you want. Freedom two is the freedom to distribute copies, and freedom three is the freedom to share your own modifications. By 1991, the GNU project had almost created a complete operating system. They had a compiler, a linker, file system, text editors, search tools. All they were missing was a working operating system kernel. Which is a bit like saying you've almost built a car. You've got wheels and seats and windows and a stereo and a gearbox. You just haven't quite figured out how to do the engine yet. Perhaps more significantly though, they had created and published a document called the GNU General Public License, the GPL, which codified the four essential freedoms into a format that, if necessary, could be enforced by a court of law, at least in theory. 
Then in 1991, Linus Torvalds, a 21-year-old student at the University of Helsinki, announced on Usenet that he was working on a free operating system, just a hobby, won't be big and professional like GNU, for 386 and 486 AT clones, and uploaded the source code for his kernel to the university's FTP server. By December, the combination of Linus's Linux kernel and the GNU tools was self-hosting. You could use it to compile itself, and Linus had published his code under the GNU general public license. For the first time in history, there was a complete working computer operating system that contained no proprietary code or patents, and which was distributed under a license agreement that guaranteed its users the freedom to run it, modify it, share it, and even sell it, as long as they didn't try to impose any restrictions on the customers they sold it to. The combination of the GNU project and the Linux kernel wasn't just free, it was also really quite good. It was fast, secure, and scalable. It ran well on extremely modest hardware. And during the 1990s, interest in the World Wide Web created a massive spike in demand for server-capable operating systems, which led to a bit of a weird situation. If your company wanted to set up a web server or an email server or a database, you could do the whole thing without spending any money as long as you had the time and the expertise to do it. If you knew how to compile the Apache web server from source, you go right ahead. Most companies didn't. They wanted to buy something that would just work and have a phone number that they could call if it didn't. Companies like Red Hat and Suzy, they saw an opportunity here. They could sell free software download all the sources, compile them, put them on a CD-ROM in a nice box with a printed manual, maybe throw in a year of technical support, and as long as they made it clear that all of the actual code that they were providing was also available on the internet for free, that was all completely legal. The biggest stumbling block was that word, free. Free meant too many things to too many people. Companies struggled with the idea of paying money for free software, and the confusion was making it increasingly obvious that there was a significant gap between the hardline definition of free adopted by the GNU project and the closed source proprietary model used by companies like Microsoft. When Netscape announced plans to release the source code to their Navigator web browser in 1998, it galvanized the community into coming up with a better term. One of the key players in that movement was Christine Peterson, the founder of the Foresight Institute, a nanotech research nonprofit in San Francisco. And at a meeting in February 1998, she was the first person to use the term open source in connection with free software. The term stuck. Within days, Eric Raymond and Bruce Perens had set up the opensource.org website, Netscape began referring to their forthcoming code publication as Open Source, and an event in April 1998 organized by Tim O'Reilly as the Free Software Summit soon became known as the Open Source Summit. Open source wasn't just about avoiding the word free, though. It was about addressing a complex but legitimate concern that was beginning to get a lot of traction in the industry. The GNU general public license is sometimes referred to as a viral license because of a clause in that license which specifically requires you to make the source code to any distributed derivative works available under the same license. And if you don't, I can sue you because I still own my code, and that's the key to understanding how the GPL works. If I release my code into the public domain, I waive any future copyright claim I have over that code. If I contribute code to an open source project that requires a contributor license agreement, a CLA, then I transfer ownership of my contributions to the legal body named in that CLA. If any of you folks here have contributed code to the .NET runtime, you'll have signed a document transferring ownership and copyright of that code to the .NET Foundation. If you've contributed code that's been included in React, you'll have signed Meta's contributor license agreement. If I publish code under the GPL, though, I do not in any way relinquish my legal rights as the author of that code. The fact you can buy it, use it, run it, modify it, share it, put it on GitHub doesn't stop the code I wrote being legally recognized as my work. I am still the legal author and owner, and I have chosen to make that work available to you under the terms of a license. If you publish a modified version of my code in any form, that means you've agreed to the terms of the license. And if you don't obey those terms, I can take you to court. At least that was the theory. 
but for a long while, nobody actually put it to the test. Then in 2003, Andrew Miklas, who uh, you might have heard of, he went on to found a company called PagerDuty. Andrew sent an email to the Linux kernel mailing list about this, the Linksys WRT54G wireless router. This was a hugely popular home router in the early 2000s. It cost $129. Linksys had sold nearly half a million units in the first quarter of 2002. Andrew had downloaded a copy of the firmware for the router, extracted the contents, and determined that the WRT54G was actually running a Linux kernel and a bunch of other software covered by the GPL, but there was no mention of this anywhere on Linksys' website. The reason this was particularly interesting was that the router firmware included drivers for a whole range of wireless networking chips. And this was in the days when getting Wi-Fi to work on Linux absolutely sucked. The community really wanted those drivers. And selling half a million routers definitely counted as distributing software. So under the terms of the GPL, Linksys was legally obliged to make the complete source code available to anybody who'd bought a WRT54G router. Now this is the fun part. While all this is going on, Linksys gets acquired by Cisco Systems, and Cisco find out they've got a problem. Linksys had bought all the Wi-Fi chips and the router from a company called Broadcom. Broadcom in turn had outsourced the firmware development to an overseas developer who had somehow failed to mention that the firmware they delivered was built on Linux and GPL code. Now, there's a detail here that I can't quite figure out from what's available online. Cisco released the source code for the Linksys WRT router in 2003. The slash dot post talking about that is still online. That release formed the nucleus of a project called OpenWRT, a GNU Linux distribution for embedded devices, and in the process, it turned the Linksys WRT54G into one of the most popular devices in history, because thanks to the OpenWRT project, it wasn't just a wireless router anymore. Router? Router? I should really decide how I say that word, shouldn't I? Uh, it was a $100 headless Linux computer with a wireless chip and a four-port network switch. So we know the code was published in 2003. We also know that in 2003, the Free Software Foundation began working with Cisco to help them achieve GPL compliance, and that five years later, the Free Software Foundation ran out of patience and filed a lawsuit against Cisco Systems regarding the use of GPL software in Linksys devices. The lawsuit and the date of the filing is a matter of public record. What I couldn't figure out is exactly what happened in the intervening five years. My hunch is that Cisco was publishing the odd release here and there and hoping the whole thing would blow over, and the FSF was getting frustrated by the apparent lack of progress, but Whatever the circumstances, it was the first time the Free Software Foundation made it as far as actually taking legal action. And in May 2009, the case was settled out of court, with Cisco appointing a compliance director, committing to make the full source code available for any product which used GPL code, and making an undisclosed financial contribution to the Free Software Foundation. Now, a company like Cisco settling out of court is a pretty good indicator that some very expensive lawyers have told them, don't go to court with this or you'll probably lose. But it's still not quite as good as an actual legal verdict. The only instance I could find of the GPL actually making it as far as a court verdict was in Germany. In 2006, Harald Welter, a free software evangelist who'd contributed code to the Linux kernel, filed suit against D-Link for selling a network-attached storage device based on GNU Linux without making the source code available. The Frankfurt District Court ruled in Welter's favor, confirming the validity of the GPL under German law. D-Link was ordered to pay Welter's costs and to stop distributing the device in question. Whether they did or not, I have no idea. If any of you folks out there has been following the controversial license changes announced over the last few years by projects like Redis, Unity, Terraform, well, if any of those projects had been published under the GNU general public license, they wouldn't have been able to change their licensing terms. Not without completely rebuilding their software from scratch and doing so in such a way that they were able to prove that they hadn't modified or incorporated any GPL licensed code into the new version. One extremely high-profile open source project that was published under the GPL 
is WordPress. And uh, when WordPress founder Matt Mullenweg said a few months ago that WP Engine, a WordPress hosting provider, was, quote, free to offer their hacked up bastardized simulacra of WordPress GPL code to their customers, and they can experience WordPress as WP Engine envisions it, with them getting all of the profits and providing all of the services, He's exactly right. The four freedoms enshrined in the GPL absolutely include the freedom to, as Mullenweg so eloquently put it, hack up and bastardize the WordPress GPL code, provide all the services, and get all the profits. If Mullenweg didn't want that to happen, he shouldn't have published WordPress under the GPL. And it also raises the rather intriguing possibility that since Matt Mullenweg is the chief executive of both the WordPress.com corporation and the WordPress nonprofit that administers the open source code base, if WordPress.com did attempt to change the license under which WordPress is published, Matt Mullenweg would have to sue himself for not sharing his own code with himself. Now, despite the ongoing challenges around sustainable free software, most of which boil down to how can we give something away for free and still get paid for it, I think the GNU project and the general public license have been a huge benefit to the software industry and to the wider world. My greatest frustration with it isn't technical or ideological. It's what I think it should have been called. Because the thing about a recursive acronym is that the first letter of GNU could have been anything. A new is not Unix, B new is not Unix, FNU's not Unix, SNU's not Unix. And according to at least one account, that is literally how they chose the name. Went through every letter of the alphabet, they stuck on snot Unix or is not Unix. And sooner or later, you get to the absolutely wonderful Xenu, which is both short for Xenu is not Unix and the word Unix backwards, which would have been an absolutely delightfully perfect name for the GNU project except it was already taken by another operating system project started at Purdue University a few years earlier, which hardly anybody has ever heard of. Folks, I hope you found that interesting. Thank you for tuning in, as always. I'll be at the Tweakers Developer Summit in Utrecht on December 4th, so if any of you folks are going to be there, come and say hello. And then December 19th, I'm in Oslo for the NDC Eula Board. The uh, folks behind NDC conferences, they're throwing a big Christmas party for the Norwegian tech industry. Three-course dinner, drinks, comedy, live music, karaoke, a big geek Christmas quiz. If that sounds like fun and you fancy coming along or bringing your team, tickets are on sale now at ndcxmas.com. Until then, folks, you all have a good week out there. You take it easy, look after each other, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.